Well, hello everybody. It's now a month later than my last uh, opportunity to work with you. Probably that was about the 25th of September, something like that, and tomorrow's the 25th of October. And we had uh, been working on the various threads, energy threads which connect the physical body to the etheric body, to the astral body, mental body, and eventually into the egoic lotus. So there's some, I think, degree of complexity about this, but it's been spelled out pretty clearly in this book, The Rays and the Initiations. And in, in our last program, program 26, I think we went over it uh, with a fair uh, degree of care. The uh, connections to the love petals, to the knowledge petals to the finally to the sacrifice petals which then connect with the uh, heart and the head all of this is spelled out here just a little bit before we're going to begin today and uh, we have it here uh, in these three uh, statements from the physical to the vital or etheric bottle a uh, body and uh, uh, this is an extension of the life thread between the heart and the spleen from the physical and vital regarding them as a unity to the astral or emotional vehicle. This thread emanates from or is anchored in the solar plexus and is carried upwards. Who knows by what means? It's, it's a simple term, carried upwards. But what are the internal metaphysics of uh, this upward carrying? It's carrying upwards by means of aspiration, it's got to be uh, an increase in vibration in the various strata uh, of the astral vehicle, making it come into resonance with the love petals of the egoic lotus. And then from the physical and astral vehicles to the mental body, one terminus is anchored in the head, and the other in the knowledge petals of the egoic lotus being carried forward by an act of will. And then later... Um, all three uh, for advanced humanity. Advanced humanity is in process of linking the three lower aspects, which we call the personality, with the soul itself, through meditation, discipline, service, and directed attention. All sounds like a very, you know, controlled life uh, from the illumined mind. When this has been accomplished, a definite uh, relation is established between the sacrifice or will petals of the egoic lotus and the head and uh, heart centers, thus producing a synthesis between consciousness, the soul, and the life principles. The process of establishing this interlinking and interrelation and the strengthening of the bridge thus constructed goes on until the third initiation. Uh, it's there that the focus of the consciousness can definitely be uh, within the within the head, I'm trying to adjust this a little bit. I have on my are uh, these, you know. I think I called my other headset my my Darth Vader headset. But anyway, I <laughs> I realized that uh, this can p present quite a, a spectacle, and maybe the 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 smaller headphones are more desirable. But these have somehow a thicker cord, you know, and they don't. It doesn't rip so easily, and uh, we don't get such intermittency. So if you can put up with this um, great white headset, I think uh, I'll try to use it for a while. Okay, so the lines of force are then so interrelated that the soul and its mechanism of expression are a unity, and basically soul infusion to a very great extent, at least 75%, is occurring by the third initiation. We can somewhat tell the degree of soul infusion by the degree of atomic matter uh, that is in the various vehicles and what we're told at the first initiation, 25%, second, 50%, third, 75%, and finally by the fourth degree, 100% atomic matter. This, of course... Uh, presents kind of an interesting situation if one keeps one's body, because obviously the physical body is not made of atomic matter, but the etheric body will be. And a higher blending and fusing can then go on. So I think we're ready then. Um, mm -mm. 
the thread of energy we call the life or spirit aspect, okay, and the consciousness aspect or the faculty of soul knowledge. Um, let's see where we are here. I, I went back quite a ways, didn't I? And now I have to find our place. Oh, very strange. Can I have gone back that far? Goodness me. Ah, I thought I was um, beginning with Program 27. Well, this shows you, you know, that <laughs> when you're a month away from this work, and we all, we've already done Program 28 as well. So that's startling to me. Now, don't tell me we've done Program 29 as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I took a little bit of a um, detour then in discussing the threads uh, when you've already gone further in your presentation. Um, I'm just going to trust that um, my discussion of this uh, was sufficient to give us some idea of what's going on and that I can go forward here. Just making the bridge, uh, yes, we didn't go into number 30. Humanity is already the dominant kingdom in nature, at least on this planet. The fact of the hierarchy and of its imminent approach into physical appearance is becoming well known to hundreds of thousands of people today. Just think of that, you know, of course there are billions on our planet, but this might be the sufficient leaven. Uh, its recognized appearance will later set the stage for the needed preparatory phases, which will finally lead to the exoteric rule of the Lord of the World, uh, uh, eventually, emerging from his aeonial seclusion through many rounds and for a certain cycle in Shambhala. And it's interesting about the first ray which he represents, this... Uh, great seclusion and apparent isolation, even though he substands all. Emerging from his aeonial seclusion in Shambhala and coming forth into outer expression at the end of this world cycle. And maybe the world cycle has to do with the completion of seven rounds, even. There are different kinds of cycles that we uh, experience. Uh, one are the chain rounds, which go from globe to globe, but the other are the scheme rounds, which go from chain to chain. And how these actually all work together is yet to be clearly and authoritatively elucidated. I in theosophy, it was not given, really. They only dealt with chain rounds. And the simultaneously occurring uh, scheme rounds, I think on Earth, were... I suspect we're in the fourth scheme round as well as the fourth chain round and with uh, of our particular fourth chain. Uh, in Venus, I suspect uh, that the fifth uh, scheme round uh, has almost been completed and that may be all that is necessary for the planet Venus because it has... Uh, somehow worked ahead of schedule, which is quite an amazing thing. Well, there we are. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry for... <laughs> I, I guess I was, was back there. You know, Mercury has been retrograde for this entire month, and I found myself going back over the uh, personal identity profile uh, two with my colleague Rick Good and my other statistical colleague, Kathy Manker, and we we have been uh, preparing PIP number three. And that's been a lot of numbers. So, you know, there are some advantages and disadvantages to Mercury retrograde because we've ha been able to go back over all of our work and a lot of it is numerical work and discover um, important things, including errors, which we have tried to eliminate. And hopefully it will be possible for everyone to have a better grasp of the rays on which they find themselves. All right, so now we will actually begin with uh, program number 30. Okay. The point which I seek to emphasize is that only when the aspirant takes his stand with definiteness upon the mental plane, 
An aspirant can do that. Okay, an aspirant to initiation. Anyone who has not yet taken the third initiation is in a way an aspirant, also a disciple, however, and keeps his focus of awareness increasingly there. Does it become possible for him to make real progress in the world of divine bridge building? Yes, that's right. We've been working on the Antikorana. Okay. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. Right memory, said the Buddha, and um, during a mer Mercury retrograde period, it is possible to abandon that uh, memory or find it slipping away. Anyway, we've been working with the divine bridge building. The work of invocation and the establishing of a conscious rapport. Conscious rapport, simultaneous conscious rapport, between the triad, the soul, and the personality, so that one knows what is going on on all three levels simultaneously. This is a kind of continuity of consciousness. The period covered by the conscious building of the Antikorana is that from the final stages of the path of probation to the third initiation. And, um, well, you know, uh, in some ways, I would suspect that this Antikorana, um, uh, even after the third degree, the Antikorana may continue to uh, take in the higher aspects of the spiritual triad, namely the Buddhic plane and the Buddhic vehicle and the Atmic plane. But I think that um, the pathway into the spiritual triad, linking firmly with the abstract mind, the monastic primitive atom, is completed by the third degree. So the final stages of the path of probation, what is that? Now, shall we say that that is before the first initiation, or shall we say something other than that? Shall we say that the path of probation lasts until the onset of, uh, let's see, accepted, uh, accepted discipleship. Accepted discipleship, um, which begins perhaps, uh, often at least, midway between the first and uh, second initiation. So it depends on how we want to look at this path of uh, probation. It is possible to consider it um, as leading up to the first initiation and ending there when a person becomes a true disciple, or it is possible to consider to consider that one is really a probationary disciple all the way until one is an accepted disciple. In one of, in one of the ways of looking at it, we put the stage of discipleship between probationary disciple and accepted disciple. In the other way of looking at it, one is still a probationary disciple all the way uh, past the first initiation until one becomes an accepted disciple. So we'll have to, uh, you know, look at both of those possibilities. Um, they are, uh, both of them uh, seem uh, justified in various contexts. In considering this process, uh, the building of the Antikorana, it is necessary in the early stages to recognize the three aspects of the mind as they express themselves on the mental plane, upon the mental plane and produce varying states of consciousness upon that plane. Now, you know, there are aspects of the mind which transcend the mental plane. We can say that um, Buddhic mind is transcendental mind, capable of uh, appreciating uh, all things through pure reason. And there is also a kind of atmic mind, since the atmic plane is the third plane correlated then with mentality, or the fifth from below. It has a number three and five, which are both mental numbers. But now we're talking about um, aspects of the mind expressing on the mental plane, I suppose, the concrete mind, the son of mind, and also the abstract mind. It is interesting to note that uh, having um, reached the developed um, human stage, developed human stage, integrated, um, aspiring, oriented, 
and devoted. So I suppose, uh, you know, it's a fairly integrated personality. And the desires have been turned upwards, and one is oriented towards the soul and actually devoted to the higher aspects within oneself. The man stands firmly upon the lower levels of the mental plane. Okay. Uh, of that mental plane. And I suppose what we mean there is that he can work from the fourth subplane of the mental plane. He is then faced by uh, the seven subplanes of that plane with their corresponding states of consciousness. And even though the Antikorana building, I, I do believe, can be considered to be occurring from the fourth subplane, the other mental capacities of subplanes seven, six, and five belong to him as well. So he is then faced by the seven subplanes of that plane with their corresponding states of consciousness. He is therefore entering upon a new cycle where, uh, this time equipped with full self-consciousness, mm -hmm. well, uh, you know, uh, as a personality at least, you know, he's not fully conscious of his entire nature as a soul, he has seven states of mental awareness to develop. And uh, we have, you know, mental clairaudience, uh, mental, uh, let's see, how does it go? Uh, mental psychometry, yes, seven and six. Mental, mental um, clairvoyance, five. Discrimination, sub four. Spiritual discernment, sub three. Uh, response to group vibration, sub two. And a spiritual telepathy, sub one. These are all innate uh, or inherent uh, in him. And all, when mastered, lead to one or other of the seven major initiations. Now this is interesting because even though they don't open the door directly, they have a correspondence. These seven states of consciousness beginning from the first to the lowest. Okay, so let's see how he describes them. Um, these seven have a connection with the seven initiations. He describes the mental plane. Well, um, I guess the way he's doing this... Um, is to bring together certain of the subplanes. He's not discriminating uh, each one. Lower mental awareness, the development of true mental perception uh, that a human being is capable of, and this is still, still within the realm of the concrete mind. Then we have soul awareness or soul perception. This is not the perception of the soul by the personality. And that's so important. This is more contemplative, but the registering of that which the soul perceives by the soul itself. So we have to be identified as a soul uh, in order to have this type of perception. We must be identified as a soul in order to have this type of perception. Uh, and then this type of perception that the soul perceives, if, if you read carefully, uh, uh, Alice Bailey's uh, discussion on um, contemplation in uh, her book uh, From Intellect to Intuition, I think a very good um, description of this kind of process is given uh, in, in her discussion of the contemplative process. A Libran process, D.K. tells us, therefore, associated with Venus. Okay, so... Um, Registration, registering of that which the soul perceives by the soul itself. And this is later registered by the lower mind. So we're not focused in the lower mind and getting some bright idea from the soul. We are seeing as a soul, and indeed we are a soul, but it's a question of identification. How do we uh, learn to uh, identify and recognize ourselves as a soul and perceive as a soul and know that we are perceiving as a soul. So this is later registered by the lower mind and this soul perception is therefore the reversal of the usual attitude of mind. So, so often we, what do we do? We take the attitude, uh, we say, usually we take the attitude 
of an aspiring personality looking towards the soul. But here we are the soul and looking uh, towards our instrument and its mental body. Okay. And then we go to something further, higher abstract awareness. This involves a monastic permanent atom. And this leads to the unfoldment of the intuition and the recognition of intuitive process by the lower mind. I suppose there's a connection there of... Uh, now, usually the intuition is not said to be directly associated with higher abstract awareness if he's talking about the abstract mind. But that type of mind is very susceptible to the uh, higher... Uh, uh, into, to the intuition. And from the abstract mind, uh, via the Antikorana, impression can be made upon the lower mind. So, you know, often DK does discriminate quite a bit between higher abstract awareness, the, um, the expansive thoughts, which are still uh, connected with the mental plane, uh, the expansive thoughts of the abstract mind, and the true ideas of uh, the buddhic plane which the intuition presents to the abstract mind. Some are great thinkers in the world of higher abstract awareness, and the question, question is, <coughs> excuse me, to what extent has that awareness been fertilized by the impression of true ideas from the buddhic plane? With respect to ideas, I don't think ideas end on the buddhic plane. Uh, I think they become ever more refined and rise plane after plane once we have contacted the lowest of the cosmic ethers. And, well, every great being is really an idea. Every being is an idea, actually. At least that's the way I've come to think of it. And... When we look at the solar logos, that's an idea. A, a galactic logos, that's an idea. So we have to realize that ideation and ideas exist on planes beyond those that have even been listed when the seven usual cosmic planes are listed. So it gets to be a very lofty subject. But, you know, for us it's quite sufficient to contact the realm of, uh, the, uh, of the beginning of the true ideas, which is on the buddhic plane. And then it will impress the plane of abstract mind, which will impress the lower mind via the antikarana. Then we have the buddhic plane, um, and I think this is, this is very, very good. Now, all of this is part of this... Uh, all of this is part of the awareness which the building of the Antikorana makes possible. Um, DK was talking about seven planes of... Aha, um, uh -huh, this is interesting. He was talking about seven planes, seven states of mental awareness. Mm -hmm. He has seven states of mental awareness and all these are inherent in him. He, ha uh, he has faced by the seven subplanes of that plane with their corresponding states of consciousness, which seem to be connected uh, in general with the seven categories he's given us. And I, I think these seven categories are very, somehow very good uh, expressions or descriptions of what we can expect to find upon these higher planes. Buddhic plane, persistent, conscious, spiritual awareness. After all, it is called the spiritual triad, isn't it? Uh, the, the spiritual triad is called the <laughs> spiritual triad. And it has to do uh, with that which is perceived by the true ego, the true soul, on cosmic etheric levels. This is the full consciousness of the Buddha intuitional level. Now, the intuitional level actually is ascribed to the fourth sub-level of the Buddhic plane, and the two highest levels of the Buddhic plane are said to be actually beyond the reach of a master. 
So when he says the full consciousness of the Buddhic plane, one tends to think of at least the intuitional level and maybe the level of idealism on the fifth uh, or the third sublevel, third from the top. This is the perceptive consciousness, which is the outstanding characteristic of the hierarchy. The, and, and we have to remember the majority of uh, ashrams are now located on the Buddhic plane. The life focus of the man shifts to the Buddhic plane, and this is the fourth or middle state of consciousness and embraces, uh, I suppose, what we call comprehension, seventh level healing, sixth level divine vision, fifth level, and then intuition, fourth sub-level. And eventually this kind of idealism which uh, leads to the monad. It's not emotional idealism as is found on the highest level of the emotional plane, but it is a more abstract type of idealism which really enters the realm of ideas and uh, makes contact via the number six with the monad, which is on the sixth subplane from counting from below upward. So, persistent, conscious, spiritual awareness and um, I, I suppose, you know, this is really characterized uh, by by pure reason, no, that, wouldn't, that won't do, pure reason and truth. Um, no longer is the mind the mediating principle here. The, the mind um, is a kind of veil upon the instantaneous realization of truth behind all the veils. And of course I suppose there are ever subtler veils and truth becomes ever more p pure and impressive, but let us just say that if we were able to truly focus upon the Buddhic plane with consistency, we would be initiates of the fourth degree. And of course the Master's ability uh, in includes this type of focus and also more contact with the spiritual will as coming from the atmic plane. So the life focus of the man shifts to the buddhic plane. Maybe at the third degree it's the higher mental plane and especially the abstract mind, depending on the ray I suppose, and by the time we reach the fourth degree, what he has been practicing between the third and the fourth degree, this intuitional consciousness becomes his life focus. So this is the fourth and middle state of consciousness. And notice that all of these levels um, correspond to a state of consciousness. Now the atmic plane. Let's see how he describes it here. The consciousness of the spiritual will, as it is expressed and experienced upon atmic levels, or upon the third plane, of divine manifestation, the plane on which the A-U-M rings out, we are told in a treatise on cosmic fire. Okay, there is little I can say about this condition of awareness. It is its state of nirvanic awareness can mean but little to the average disciple. Well, and I suppose we really do have to think about the Buddha as a third ray monad who underwent the sixth initiation on that third ray, I believe, and had a touch of the cosmic mental plane thereby, and this would mean that when he started to go through the nirvana experience, he was resonating with those higher levels associated with the number three. So, uh, it is possible, I suppose, to remain aware of the spiritual triad and not become the onward journeying monad on one of uh, six or eight paths that don't have to do with earth service. I suppose if you, if you choose the path of earth service, which apparently the Buddha was not supposed to have chosen, this is a great mystery, um, you will remain in full possession of your spiritual triad and 
will be able to work with humanity in the service of Sanat Kumara, who retains a certain number of those high initiates for that type of service. But let's just say this is the doorway. The nirvanic consciousness is the doorway uh, to the true, ever-growing nirvana that um, occurs as the monad pursues its destiny and, and rises, in its essence, to ever higher subplanes uh, and of the cosmic physical plane and then on into the cosmic astral and for some onto the cosmic mental and for some onto the cosmic buddhic plane, the sixth path, the path the, the Logos is on. We don't really know. He hasn't said anything about paths eight and nine, which are now open. You kind of wonder whether they're associated with the sort of eighth and ninth Pleiad in the Pleiades, the father and mother. Atlas and Pleione, the other sisters, uh, are the seven, and maybe are termini of the seven paths. But then there are the still higher paths which await description. You know, they can't be too relevant to us, can they? Uh, except in terms of an envisioned uh, destiny. And uh, giving us a great sense of... Uh, what lies ahead, the uh, spiritual possibilities that lie ahead, which would excite so many people, I would say, more than they are excited by the prospect of uh, the type of heaven that is promised to them, which is really so often a very material projection. Okay, and then uh, level number six, it is so much associated with six and the sixth ray, the inclusive awareness of the monad upon its own plane. Notice he's used a second-ray term. This is, a, this is a focus for the essential life, which is on plane number two or plane number six, depending on how you look at it. Um, and inclusivity is the great quality of the second ray, this being a, a second-ray soul planet and this being a second-ray soul solar system. The inclusive awareness of the monad upon its own plane, the second plane of our planetary life. So he's not going to say too much, but um, this will not only be a planetary awareness, which could be quite complete, um, well, up to a point anyway, you know, it, at least in terms of our solar system. The solar system is only considered to go to the logoic plane, and beyond that we have the vehicles of the uh, planetary logos, the astral and mental vehicles, but they are technically not considered to be part of his precipitated solar system. So what will be this awareness of the monad on its own plane? Well, maybe we can get some kind of transmitted awareness when we begin to think, however dully, of beingness right here on our own levels. The great mystery that anything should be <clears throat> at all. The contrast between something that might be, that is, and the fact that it might not be at all. I remember I was discussing this with my son, who is a philosopher, and I recognize that we've been talking about this for about 2,500 years, <laughs> back from the pre- Socratic philosophers. There was a real resonance there, and he was going to write a thesis on that something is rather than is not. So it's a fairly ontological uh, subject uh, about the nature of being. And when you're on the third ray, I suppose there is that tendency to, uh, to think in those terms. But anyway, inclusivity, you know, it, it's said that beautiful mantra, connect with the second ray, naught is but me. Uh, you've seen that. There's a, there's a word of power, or one of those great mantras for each one, uh, one of the rays, and the one that we have for the second ray, naught is but me. Um, and that is, you know, the ultimate inclusivity, if you will. And then, still another state of consciousness. I can't really say it's, well, it's, it's not really mental consciousness. And yet, you know, what D.K. would say, he would say, the abstract mind is the doorway 
to the logoic plane. He would say also, you know, the, or probably at least he's hinted at this, that the second subplane of the mental plane on which we have what we call uh, response to group vibration is, is the doorway to the monadic plane. And the third subplane whereon we have spiritual discernment is the doorway to the uh, atmic plane with its uh, realization of spiritual will and law, which the Buddha so much emphasized, you know. Kind of curious, you know, the fact that he's almost certainly a third-ray monad and yet is on the first sub-ray of the second-ray soul. The ray intricacies get pretty bewildering, at least for people at our stage of consciousness. I did make a stab at that in creating the TARA test, T-A-R-A, Transpersonal Astro-Rheological Analysis, in which I gave people the opportunity to speculate upon their soul sub-rays, their triadal rays, and there are certain laws connected with those. And, um, you know, 168 and 169 of Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1, you know, make sure you read that when talking about triadal rays, because otherwise people are just starting assigning rays willy-nilly to the spiritual triad, and there's laws, you just can't do that. And then uh, the lesser monadic ray and the greater or major monadic ray. I gave people, <laughs> no doubt, a premature opportunity to speculate on those matters, but at least to stretch the mind in that direction is useful. So if you're you know, listening to this at some future time, after which I'm no longer inhabiting this particular body, do turn yourself to the Terra test at some point. Uh, to see what you might learn and maybe how you might improve it. And I'm hoping that it will be extant at that time. Okay, so we come to the seventh level, to which the seventh uh, or, or the first, depending on how you look at it, subplane of the mental plane leads, divine consciousness. This is the, it's in Shambhala really, you know, Shambhala's, the council chamber is located on this level. This is the awareness of the whole on the highest plane of our planetary manifestation. It doesn't include the astral and mental bodies of the planetary logos, just like the realm of manifestation here for us is the etheric physical plane. This is also an aspect of solar awareness upon the same plane. I'm, I'm reminded of the seventh initiation, which we're going to get into, and that seventh initiation is a love-wisdom initiation, and it is very much on the second ray, and involves the solar logos. So, by the time we reach here, the, um, the planetary logos for the seventh initiation is the initiator, and the solar logos is involved in some way, and there is, uh, we imagine, a degree of solar systemic awareness on this high level. Uh, there are hints about why the solar logo should be involved at the seventh or highest level, and there's a certain creati creative hierarchy called the divine flames, and they're uh, associated or ruled by the constellation Leo, which is ruled by the sun, our solar logos. So all of those ideas do fit together, and that's going to be the great plane of Shambhala. It's the sense in which Shambhala is really a solar logoic extension. Uh, Shambhala on that level is a sea of fire. But the fire is not just chaotic, it is somehow beautifully organized. How do you organize fire? Well, we'll wait a while to discover how that's done, but apparently great uh, geometrical designs exist upon that level, and I think, you know, based upon the principle of the triangle. Okay. So, divine consciousness. What have we had so far here? We've had uh, lower mental awareness, soul awareness or perception. I just, you know, I feel I should underline and bold these. Soul awareness and perception. Then we've had higher abstract awareness, and that keeps us all on the realm, in the realm of mind per se. Mind as the human being experiences it, then uh, persistent, you know, that ongoingness of the second ray, right? Persistent conscious spiritual awareness, which is unmediated and subject to pure reason. Then 
the awareness of the atomic plane, consciousness of the spiritual will, and um, the awareness of the monadic plane. He calls it monadic awareness, oftentimes even more than he calls it monadic consciousness. He tries to discriminate uh, between consciousness as the human being understands it and higher types of consciousness because the subject-object distinction is no longer there in the kinds of consciousness that is related to the monad and still higher beings. And then uh, the seventh level, divine consciousness uh, as uh, experienced on the uh, highest level of our planetary life, awareness of planetary manifestation. Okay. As we strive to arrive at some dim comprehension, Okay, we have to start somewhere, don't we? Some dim comprehension of the nature of the work to be done in building the Antikorana. Uh, the sun has not fully risen on our Antikoranic project. It's still pre-dawn. <laughs> okay, uh, in building the Antikorana, it might be wise as a preliminary step to consider the nature of the substance out of which the bridge of shining mind stuff has to be built. You know, I can see how important it is to read this very carefully. The bridge of shining mind stuff. Okay, the, the substance out of which this bridge of shining mind stuff has to be built by the conscious aspirant. I mean, this is not done unconsciously. This is an important word. We have to know what we're doing. I remember when I first encountered the work of um, the Antikorana work in the Iron Cane School a long time ago, it seems. I just faithfully read the material without too much comprehension, but trusting that something would sink in, trying to become ever more conscious of the process. And in those lesson sets which they had prepared, um, there was a step-by-step -step process of making yourself increasingly conscious of what all the stages were. Well, you know, we're building in the substance, I suppose, um, of the higher four subplanes of the mental plane, because at least the launching pad is the mental unit, that point of tension uh, at the doorway of the higher mind. So the bridge of shining mind stuff. And the fact that it shines, you know, it tells us that it is, uh, suggests that it's capable of carrying the light. And that's what we want, more and more light as we enter these more luminous realms of the spiritual triad, exemplified, I suppose, by the second ray word of power, I see the greatest light. The oriental term for this mind stuff is chitta. Chitta, chitta. Uh, it exists in three types of substance, all basically identical, identical, but all qualified or conditioned uh, differently. Okay, so, you know, we're basically talking about the concrete mind, then the, the next two subplanes, higher mind, and then finally the abstract mind, I suppose. Let's see what he says. It is a fundamental law in this solar system, and therefore in our planetary life experience, that the substances through which divinity in time and space expresses itself is karmically conditioned. There is a past, you know, so let's just say, put it this way, substance has a past. It is impregnated by those qualities and aspects which are the product of the earlier manifestations of that being in whom we live and move and have our being. Now, notice this. Got to read carefully. Uh, sometimes we just hear about the first solar system. Okay. But if we read carefully, we understand that, th that this is the fifth solar system. And that the previous solar system was the first solar system was, in a way, the first major solar system. This is the second major solar system. And the first major solar system was preceded by three others. Where I suppose the emphasis, although he's never really talked about it, would would have been physical, astral, lower mental. And in a sense, then, the last solar system would have been mental, personal. Uh, but okay, notice, 
the earlier manifestations. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, we, we, we might just read over that very quickly, but that's a plural. You know, and uh, it shows, if we didn't know it from some other reading, that our solar locus has had earlier manifestations. And not just one. Not just one solar system which preceded this one. It is impregnated by those qualities and aspects which are the product of earlier manifestations of that being in whom we live and move and have our being. And when we talk about the one in whom we live and move and have our being, we can sometimes think it is the planetary logos, but definitely it also includes, uh, it uh, must include the solar logos. So this is the basic fact lying behind the expression of that trinity or triad of aspects with which all the world religions have made us familiar. So, you know, there was a strong third-ray coloring in the previous solar system. And this uh, meant that a trinity of aspects uh, impressed itself and carried on into this present solar system via the primordial ray, as we call it. Not the divine ray, but the primordial ray from the previous solar system, the third ray. Um, so this is the basic fact lying behind the expression of that trinity or triad of aspects with which all world religions have made us familiar. Uh, the trinity from a solar system in which the third ray was important. Now, you know, I suppose if one really looks at this, you know, you say, well, why not? Why wasn't the fourth ray important in that previous solar system? And maybe it was to a degree. I think it was preceded by uh, three other solar systems. Well, there's seven solar systems in all, but that's a mystery too because the next one's supposed to be the last. But you know how DK does. He tends to count a whole series as a unified thing, and that would be the seventh in the eternal now which is something we have to experience, <laughs> work, work on experience, experiencing. Live in the eternal, know the self as one. Okay, so anyway, uh, this trinity is as follows, the Father aspect. This is the underlying plan of God. Uh, the will aspect, it's, it's, these are all related, the essential cause of being, a driving force, purpose, life purpose, motivating evolution, let's say, um, a, an end vision, uh, which draws us to it. And the note of synthetic sound. Okay, uh, the, the great sound, you know, I'm surprised he didn't capitalize the whole thing as he usually does. Um, the sound relates to the monad or to the father aspect, and utilizes the sutratma, or the life thread. This is about uh, life as it expresses itself on the cosmic physical plane. So let's see what we have here. Um, uh, it is impregnated by those qualities and aspects, which are the product of earlier manifestations of that being in whom we live and move and have our being. And I guess there's kind of a one, two, three uh, uh, preparation, uh, moving from below, uh, life, and then uh, sentiency, and then mind. But now we seem to be moving from above to below instead of from below to above. So the will aspect, the purpose, it's sometimes difficult to discriminate between the two of them, and some people like to make hard and fast uh, discriminations. It's always been my impression that there's an awful lot of... Um, patterning going on in what we call the purpose. Um, purpose to me has to be a kind of uh, an, ar an arrangement according to pure reason of the various factors involved in the evolutionary process. The will aspect, the driving force, really. So it utilizes the sutratma. Then we have the second of this trinity, the sun aspect, it's the love aspect, it's the wisdom aspect, wisdom and understanding, associated with both the second and third ray. 
Uh, it's about consciousness and the soul. So it's the sun aspect, it's the quality of sensitivity whereby we can respond to all the various emanated divisions of the one whole. The love aspect, it's meant to draw us together uh, in pure reason, according to a perfected archetypal design. Uh, the love is meant to be uh, the quality of relationship that we exemplify eventually after having worked our way through many frictions and conflicts. Wisdom and understanding, um, the method of evolution, we gradually ascend into the light and gain uh, a certain um, experience which allows us to look upon uh, all past and present opportunities with um, a, a, a more enlightened viewpoint that we can call wisdom, wisdom gained through experience. And, of course, our understanding has to do with our sense of participating in the whole. We stand under, we stand beneath it. We have kind of an immediate uh, intuitive grasp. It goes simply beyond, beyond knowledge, pure and simple. It's the consciousness factor. The soul is consciousness. And here it says, the note of attractive sound. It is, a, it is a kind of subtle note drawing all together in right relationship, which is loving relationship, uh, wisely understood, uh, with full sensitivity uh, and sentiency, so that we feel into and identify with all those that have been drawn into loving relationship. And then that uses the consciousness thread. And uh, this consciousness thread is developed increasingly by man as we reach out to touch all the various factors which have been included in this creation until we become what we always have been, the one which underlies creation and has demonstrated itself to itself through creation. Then the mother aspect, the intelligence of substance, and here he means, I think, um, not the high philosophical substance, but uh, the th that of which matter is composed and that which builds form, or that which is, uh, of which form is constituted, really, the second aspect is the form builder. It's the intelligence aspect um, which brings together form under the law of economy so that it is fit to move into that type of relationship determined by love. First we move into economical relationships, but then we transcend the third ray and move into proper archetypal loving relationships. It's the Holy Spirit. Um, and connected with it is the response uh, to evolution. It's interesting, the will to evolve is connected with the third ray. And he tells us all about education, learning the ropes, learning the lines of energy, so to speak, so that we can maneuver uh, in all that we discover and make the proper arrangement, which eventually uh, we're assisted by the magnetism of love by that note of attraction, after we intelligently make the various forms fit to be drawn into loving relationship, then the law of attraction does that. So this is the green note of nature. This is the fa. The note of attractive sound is the sol, do re mi fa sol. It's the uh, blue note, the second ray note. And the note of uh, synthesis is the red note. Uh, and, let's see, yeah, the note of synthetic sound. Red, in a sense, is the synthetic color, um, although that, that's only in an, that's in an ultimate sense in a solar system in which the great being had a first-ray solar monad, and I think our, our solar logos has neither. So for us, it's the great indigo blue that is the synthetic sound, but in our next solar system we will have 
the great red note sounding, and it will uh, produce a very synthetic uh, manifestation of the great second ray solar logos. Well, there, do we believe what the uh, Hindu uh, Brahmanic uh, chronology tells us, that uh, each uh, solar system is lasting trillions of years? Our present solar system said to last 311 40 billion, 311 trillion, 40 billion Earth years. Um, things start going faster, and maybe the previous solar system was even longer, the next one will be shorter, but we're talking in gargantuan terms. Uh, a huge, huge number of years, and so it really helps to be patient. <laughs> because, after all, you know, timelessness, um, a being that has forever been and will forever be, does not have to worry about time, except in a relative sense when trying to enact that which is scheduled by the plan uh, within time and space. There we have our concerns, but in an ultimate sense, we cannot be concerned about running out of eternal duration. We've been at it forever, and of course it just boggles the mind to try to think about that. I don't think the mind can actually grasp what forever is. I, I've broken my mind on this many, many times, and maybe show the, <laughs> the symptoms of having a broken mind. But uh, I've dashed my mind upon the rocks of eternity, or foreverness, or endless duration, it's just a hard, hard thing to grasp that there was no cause to what we are. We are, we ourselves are the causeless cause, and all we ever do is a process of self-becoming. And uh, behind it all is that which forever is, and forever remains unchanged. Being cries forth and says, untranslatable, Death crumbles all, existence disappears, yet all for A remains untouched, immutably the same. Yet all for A remains untouched, immutably the same, God is. Those are those six trumpeted words which are associated in ancient Atlantean days with the third realizations of the third initiation and are the key to all philosophy, we are told by Master Decay. So how can there be change and changelessness? How can there be immutability, which means changelessness, I suppose, and periodicity at the same time? Maybe it's all concealed in the word essential. And maybe that's what is meant when we are told that the universe is maya. It's not real. It's actual. It's not real. It doesn't last. It's a great impermanence. And behind it all, is that which for A, a remains, untouched, immutably the same. Okay, little philosophical deviation here. Not the, maybe the kind of philosophy we're taught in, uh, in the university, but uh, uh, a kind of wisdom philosophy, if you will. Well, um, what I'm going to do here since this is my first one that I've done in some time, this is the end of um, Rays and Initiation Webinar Commentary Program 30. And we're on page um, 464. And this will be the beginning of Rays and Initiation Webinar Commentary Program 31. Next time I won't make that mistake, and we'll begin on page 464. We've covered, you know, maybe just a little here, not not so very much. Uh, yep, yeah. 462 to 464. I'll put that in here as well. I'm just going to get this out to you. I don't know whether you're going to listen to this in a day or whether it'll be 10 years from now. But in any case, um, 
it makes so much sense to work meticulously with what Master DK has given us. This it, it's just impregnated with the deepest wisdom. Could we but realize it, and could we, uh, as he says, read carefully? So often he says we just don't read carefully. But, you know, I'm forcing myself to read carefully. We're all reading carefully together. And you might come to some different conclusions that I will. But at the moment, at least, um, we're working together. So we will continue with this uh, work on the Antikorana shortly. Okay, I'll see you. See you then.